Uh, we're going to start now. Uh, hi everyone and welcome to this webinar about modeling of recycling with the speakers Thomas Ekvall from Chalmers and Panilla Sederstrand from SCT. Uh, you can only see and hear us at the moment, uh, but as a matter of fact, I can see that we are approaching 100 persons listening in on this webinar. Uh, a warm welcome to you all. Before Thomas and uh, Pernilla will take over the scene, uh, I will give a short introduction to Swedish Life Cycle Center, who we are and what we do. But first, some guidelines and information uh, that the, the for, for the webinar. Uh, if you do not see the presentations, you can find them in our calendar. Uh, and uh, we, will, we will start with our presentations, so save your questions to the end. Uh, and that's why you are muted during the presentations. And when it is time for questions, in the end, we will be able to unmute you if you have a question. We will recall the webinar and uh, it can uh, soon after be found on our YouTube channel. If you have a colleague or a friend that would like to see the presentations uh, afterwards. Uh, and we will send the presentations to all of you who participate after the webinar. So, Swedish Life Cycle Center. Uh, we are a collaboration platform for academia, industry and research institutes, as well as government agencies. And our aim is for credible and applied life cycle thinking globally. Our mission is to work for the integration of the life cycle perspective, uh, into processes and decision-making in industry, government, government policy and other parts of society. Uh, the overall aim is to develop products and services with, with increased resource efficiency that enhances sustainable consumption and production patterns. And we want to contribute to work towards a more circular economy uh, and meet our common sustainability challenges and sustainability, sustainable development goals. We are a partner-driven center uh, that started 1996 uh, and today we are uh, 14 partners and seven government agencies in collaborations and our network involves more than 400 life cycle professionals but there is room for more uh, so if you are working in an organization that are not part uh, on this slide uh, please if you're interested contact us and we will uh, show it what benefits there are being a partner. Uh, and this is what we do. Uh, we're actually in one of these dots now, uh, webinars and seminars. Uh, I will not go through them all because that's not time. We don't have time for that. But uh, I encourage you to visit our website to find out more about ongoing research projects. Maybe uh, also about our two-day course for applied life cycle thinking uh, and the, our working groups where life cycle professionals can share knowledge uh, and learn from each other. So website is one part, but please don't be a stranger. Follow us in social media and sign up for our newsletters so that we can stay in touch after this webinar. And with that, uh, welcome to the webinar uh, hosted by Swedish Life Cycle Center. I will now pass the microphone to Thomas Ekvall, uh, who is a adjunct professor at Chalmers University of Technology and he's been the project manager of the project Modeling of Recycling. He will start with some background about the project uh, and after that we will listen to Pernilla Sederstrand, Senior en Environmental Specialist from SED, uh, who will uh, talk about how SET has been involved in the project and what they have learned through the process. Then Thomas will come back and present the results from the project. And after that, there will be time for questions. But for now, Thomas, welcome, take the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see. It should be the screen you can you see my presentation? Yes. <laughs> yeah, great. Thank you. Um, so,
um, a, a product can be produced from virgin material, uh, but recycled after use, which is product one in, in this figure, or it might be produced from recycled raw materials and disposed of after use in product, product three in this, uh, in this illustration. Many real products and uh, product life cycles are of course a mix of these two extreme cases. Uh, but recycling, uh, recycling uh, avoids disposal and also avoids virgin material production. So when you're making an LCA of a, of a single product where that includes recycled material or is, that is recycled after use, you need to decide how much of this environmental benefit should uh, be allocated to or be, be um, uh, included in the LCA of that individual product. Or you could say that uh, use, alternatively, you can, you can um, describe this allocation problem as uh, that you have a, a material that is used in, in, in this case in three different products. So how should you allocate the burdens of the uh, original virgin material production and the final disposal between these products? And this problem has been, methodological problem has been discussed for, uh, well, almost all the time, all the 30 years I've been involved in this business. Um, and many scientific papers and guidelines and uh, PhD thesis, has, has, has several PhD thesis have been written on this topic. Um, and so we still don't have an agreement. One of the latest uh, most recent approaches suggested to deal with this is the uh, circular footprint formula in the EU initiative product environment on product environmental footprints. Um, and that is a fairly complicated version and, and <coughs> it was uh, commented on and at a meeting at, at Swedish Life Cycle Center that it was difficult to apply in some cases. So we initiated this project to to uh, discuss the circular footprint formula and other options for modeling recycling and to see to what extent can we agree on how to think when modeling recycling in the LCA. And we had many partners contributed to this uh, project. The funding came from British Energy Administration through the resource program. Uh, Swedish Life Cycle Center coordinated the whole thing. <clears throat> and we had a research group with uh, Chalmers, IVL, and, and KTH, Royal Institute of Technology, uh, and several case study partners from industry and also RICE, RICE Institute. And then we had an extended working group that, besides these, the research group and case study partners, included additional companies. Uh, and a business association and uh, two author national authorities. And what we achieved was that we compiled information on available methods from various literature. And then we developed a set of criteria for assessing the methods. And these criteria can be used also beyond the, uh, beyond uh, assessing methods for uh, modeling recycling that can be used, I think, for assessing methods in general in, in environmental systems analysis. We combined, combined the information we got from on the methods and the criteria to assess the methods. This was done by, by two researchers at, at IBL. Uh, and then the industry tested the, the case studies. And you can say that it's a it's, uh, crazy to assess the methods before they are tested, uh, but we did a preliminary assessment and then we revised this assessment after the, the case studies. And then finally we had a, a debate among the uh, partners, project, many project partners, to discuss the advantages and the problems and limitations of the different methods. So the literature, 
that we looked through were included, I think, uh, all standards uh, published in English where where that uh, stipulate a uh, method for for uh, modeling and recycling. And it's interesting, I think, that different standards stipulate different methods. Um, and uh, uh, a range of important guidelines. Uh, all the guidelines that the partners considered to be important for them. Whether well, PEF is a product environmental footprint uh, and OAF stands for uh, organizational environmental footprint. EPD here stands for environmental product declarations. So this is the international system for, for environmental product declarations. And UBA further down with the, Umwelt, the German Umweltbundesamt. They had a guide on how to do LCA on packaging, including the method for, for modeling recycling. We had the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, World Steel Association, and the International Stainless Steel Federate Forum. And also Ecolumbian. And besides all these uh, standards and guidelines, we, we uh, consulted a very small selection of the many scientific papers published on this area. And from, from these uh, standards, guidelines and publication and scientific papers, we extracted information on 12 main approaches and there's different versions of, of some of these, these, uh, these approaches. Uh, you can see uh, a simple illustration of some of the methods. The simple cutoff uh, draws a line between the product life cycles, typically before the recycling process, um, which means that the recycling process belongs to, to the next uh, life cycle. And to, to the life cycle where the recycling material is used. While economic cutoff considers if the considers dividing the recycling process into two parts, if it has revenues from both the waste management service it, it performs and the material itself. Cutoff plus credit uh, also divides the. It's, it's used. It's a method used. It's called sometimes module D. It's used in. Uh, or stipulated in the standards for environmental product declarations of construction products, while the sim simply cutoff is is is, is uh, stipulated in the international system for environmental product declarations in general. Um, and it's a bit more complicated, as you can see. Uh, material losses is. Besides the simple cutoff, I think the material losses, allocation to material losses is the most common approach to modeling and recycling in MCA. It's also sometimes called end of life approach or closed loop approach because it's mod you can model it as, as uh, the, in a way that the uh, outflow of recycling material is used in the same product and then you have a net outflow. If you have a net outflow, then then uh, that goes to replacing virgin material in, in the next uh, life cycle. And, <clears throat> but, and so when you hear closed loop approach, this is typically the, the approach that you're uh, dealing with. Although uh, uh, quite, con quite different method, the virgin allocation to virgin material use, it also, could also be considered a closed loop approach. That means that uh, in the sense that the recycling material used in the product is assumed to come from the same product or modeled as if it came from the same product. And that will give completely different results. The 50-50 methods is a kind of compromise between these two. And then we had six other more, more complicated methods. And for each of them, this is for the circular footprint formula in the guideline for product environmental footprint. <clears throat> for all of them, we, we 
uh, had a section of text describing the methods and the incentives they give and uh, how what kind of data they need and they this are needed and so on and we also il illustrated them with uh, the kind of using the, the uh, three product uh, hypothetical three product case uh, with the dummy dummy figures to to show how how um, the LC results would look for the three different products. And also more expensive. This is stored in the report that will soon be uh, ready and published. And then <clears throat> we developed criteria for assessing the methods. And they, is also, they started with, with the uh, uh, viewpoint that an LCA, as all environmental systems analysis, is good to the extent that it can be expected to reduce environmental impacts, or at least environmental impacts per functional unit. For this purpose, <coughs> uh, the method must be used, so it must be fe feasible to use, it must deliver results that are fairly accurate, so they point in the right direction. Uh, this results, the method and the results and study must be possible to understand. Uh, so decisions maker, decision makers uh, understand what, what the numbers mean. Um, and this knowledge, the knowledge generated must be considered relevant as the basis for decision making to get, uh, to get the good decisions method also needs to be fairly robust to, to uh, avoid abuse, which means that the LCA is used to defend bad decisions or to point at the very large uncertainties involved and hence uh, stop a decision from a good decision from being made. These were a set of, of, of an old set of criteria that we used as a as a starting point that Anna Björklund at KKH used as a starting point to, to develop our criteria or indicators. She found that uh, the old criteria were too aggregated, so she segregated them, the five criteria, into 10 different, 10 different indicators. Uh, so for these, uh, the method being feasible, it has to do with whether it to how easy it is to use, whether the data you need can be are available and easy to get to, and whether you can use the findings from one study as the as the basis for decisions in many cases, or whether it's site site specific, for instance. Um, Okay, so it's a, it's a set of 10 different indicators and we have 12 different methods. So it was 120 assessment points that Christian Jelse and Gustav Sandin uh, had to do at IBL to assess this, the methods. So to make this feasible, we, they made the assessments only with smileys and short comments. And these are the results of the uh, of the assessment. You can see here, for instance, that the more complex methods down here <clears throat> are more difficult to apply, uh, but they are also, in general, more accurate, more re reflect to a larger and better extent the important aspects of, of the recycling and the consequences of recycling. On the other hand, then they are more difficult to understand. It's more difficult to understand their methods and results. I'll stop there for now. Uh, this is uh, the, the literature I've been uh, referring to, and uh, the <coughs> re review draft is the report is in a review draft. We have got the review comments from one of our two reviewers, and we will uh, revise the report and, and then. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Thomas. Uh, then I will share screen instead. 
So please uh, let me know if it works, <laughs> sharing yeah. the screen. Good. Good. Okay. Uh, thank you. I'm uh, very happy to see that so many people are interested. And uh, I mean, it was a big, big project with many participators and um, has been really valuable to be part of it. Of it. Um, a few words about about SET, we are a hygiene and health company. Uh, we are a global company and we um, produce and sell products that people use every day. Uh, we have uh, tissue products, which are toilet paper, household towels, hand towels, things like that. We do personal care products like incontinence products. Uh, baby diapers, feminine products, and we also have uh, some medical products like or orthopedic products or wound care products. Um, sustainability is really considered a business driver for our company and it's integrated in our strategy. We have a long history of using life cycle assessments and we also have a group of in-house LCA practitioners since, since many years. So we are using life cycle assessments in development for taking decisions. We have uh, several targets that are based on footprints calculated with LCA. And we also use especially carbon footprint improvements in external communication. So LCA is really important for us. Um, we also have a, a history of using a lot of renewable materials. That's uh, of course one of the core materials for the tissue products and it's also used in personal care products. And we have also been using recycled fibers for a long time. So we had to think about how to model recycling already when we started to use LCA. So we have been interested in, in the allocation problem for many years and also taken part in, in external discussions. So we tried to compare methods ourselves a couple of years ago and uh, initiated a smaller workshop uh, with the help of Swedish Life Cycle Center. And we have also been taking part actively in the, uh, the European Commission project around the product environmental footprint and the workshops uh, around allocation. Uh, and we, we have as many others in our uh, current sustainability st strategy, we put a lot of focus on circularity, where we really want to increase both the use of renewable and recycled materials and the reuse and recycling of all our materials and products. So there's a great focus on this at the moment. And even though we have worked already a lot with allocation, for recycling situations, we still we still struggle, <laughs> and we are really happy for this project where we again got got uh, a chance to discuss it and um, to receive a lot of input from other stakeholders. Uh, so we took part in the case study, and we used uh, the Excel calculation tool that was prepared in the project, which was very helpful and <laughs> saved a lot of time. Um, and also helped us a bit with the interpretation of the methods. Uh, we chose to use uh, generic data from a commercial LCA database for our case study. And we also narrowed down the scope a bit. So we, we have put focus on six of the 12 <laughs> selected methods. And we selected the ones that we thought were most relevant for our business. Um, our case study is about uh, polyethylene film used for packaging and we have worked with eight different scenarios for fossil and renewable plastic film and we, uh, we varied uh, the, the fate at end of life. So we have four scenarios where the uh, products 
the packaging material is incinerated at the end of life without energy recovery. And we have four scenarios. Ah, I'm losing my pointer. Uh, where the material is collected for recycling. Then we are varying. We have uh, scenarios with uh, virgin primary material that either comes from a fossil or a renewable origin. And we have also scenarios for 100% recycled content that again is feeded either with fossil or renewable feedstocks. So all in all eight scenarios. In addition to that, we decided to test three different approaches for attribution of removal of biogenic carbon. So the, the uptake of biogenic carbon. Usually you know where the emission takes place, uh, but it's not as clear how to treat removals of biogenic carbon. So while uh, removal is from growing the plants, and none of the allocation methods, to our knowledge, includes descriptions on this. So it's up, actually up to the practitioner to decide how to do this. Um, so we decided to test three approaches. Um, in one of the tests, we have sort of put the removals in the virgin material production boxes in the allocation formulas. In one of the approaches, we have put the removals in the final disposal boxes. So um, sort of together with the emissions from incineration, if the materials are incinerated. And we have also tried to interpret and use um, a description from uh, the European standard for uh, round and sawn timber, which is part of the European standard related to the EPD for the construction works, because the, that standard actually includes a description on how to treat biogenic carbon in allocation situations. Um, so uh, I will show you some of our results and uh, they all have sort of eight, eight bars. <laughs> so the first group of bars represents the materials that are incinerated. The second group, uh, the dotted bars, are the materials when they are collected for recycling. Uh, the pink bars represent materials from fossil sources and the green from renewable sources. Um, so again, <laughs> we, we, tested, uh, we tested the methods and uh, it sort of confirmed some of the findings that we had had from earlier projects. And I think, again, it's clear that there are no objective methods. That has been uh, a discussion, or I can hear it's an aim from time to time, that people want to find a method that tells the truth. <laughs> and uh, our view is that are, no methods are doing that. They all include value choices that may be intentionally or unintentionally, but you need to understand sort of the, the uh, values behind each, each method. Uh, so this method, as an example, the 0 -100 method, has decided that the important thing is to drive collection for recycling. So you will have an equal footprint for all materials that are collected through recycling, independent of what content they have. So you see different values like that in all methods. And we see again that it is, is an important decision what method you use, because we see big differences between the results. Um, and that's also why we think it's so important to always test any allocation method with relevant industry data, uh, data because that determines the size of the different contributors in the calculations. And I, it was very interesting to see the results also from the other case study participants, because we had a bit different things are different of different importance for different materials and industries. Um, and again, we found uh, that renewable materials are still a bit overlooked in recycling situations, since no methods um, also not today, we still lack descriptions on how to treat biogenic carbon. 
Um, so one of our findings was that two of the approaches we tested for the biogenic carbon gave uh, identical results. <laughs> So that was when we attributed the uptake, the removal of biogenic caramel to the final disposal. Uh, for simplification, these results um, display a net, net carbon footprint for the biogenic footprints. But we have in the calculation tool, we have it with details with uh, removals and emissions separately. Uh, it, it may be that we didn't understand <laughs> the, uh, the European standard method correct, but this was our interpretation that they were, it's identical to treating it as uh, putting it to the final disposal. Uh, however, uh, the, the second and the third approach uh, had very different results compared to the first approach when we have attributed the biogenic carbon to the virgin material production. And we see uh, uh, some very special effects from doing that. So if we attribute the biogenic carbon to the primary production, we see no, no difference between using a recycled material from renewable sources or a recycled material from fossil fuels when they are incinerated. And uh, when the materials are collected for recycling after use, um, the footprint indicates a net uh, carbon removal for each life cycle that recycles the material if you use this method, uh, which we think is not fair for, for our short-lived products, at least. We see some... Uh, um, yeah, we see big differences, which again underlines the importance of, of agreeing on this and, and also describing it in the methods. Some other findings we have um, was that all method, methods that split the burden between different life cycles, so for example the PIF circular footprint formula or the 50-50 methods, since they include uh, more you need to use generic data for the different credits and debits included, uh, which means that your, your own data or the data you own consists a smaller part. And uh, that actually leads to a bit smaller, we, th we think there's a risk that the, there will be smaller incentives for improvements. Or in any case, the, uh, the, um, the size of the changes will be smaller. Um, we are still struggling a bit internally with what, what methods to prefer. We often use more than one method as a sensitivity uh, checking. And we, uh, we use EPDs in some markets and for some products. Um, since we were involved in the PEF project, we have also been using the circular footprint formula internally in, in sensitivity checkings. And we see sort of uh, advantages and disadvantages with both these methods. We thought for many years that the simple cutoff methods like in the EPDs were good enough. Uh, but we have, but we, what we have seen lately is that they are not for our products and business giving enough incentives for collection, collection for recycling after use. And especially not for renewable materials. Um, and that's better with the circular footprint formula. So this is my, my final slide and uh, these are the main conclusions from, uh, from the case study. I think we, it has been very valuable to take part and I know that my, uh, my colleagues agree. We have taken the time to have uh, internal discussions along the road so we have sort of built up and increased the knowledge internally in our group and I think we have even though we we have not fully yet concluded on how to do in all cases we have uh, gained a lot of new input not the least from from the other uh, case study and the other project participants 
So I think we are better off now for taking a decision in the future, what to use in what situation. Uh, we have a couple of remaining issues <laughs> that we need to continue to work with. And one is that uh, we would like to dig in a bit further to energy recovery versus material recycling. Because that's often uh, a question for, for our products. And again, we see some sp uh, specific complexity for renewable materials that we think we need to address. And as I have mentioned, we see a need of continuing to work with the biogenic carbon flows for renewable materials. Uh, what we have been discussing internally is that we still see that actually none of the methods we think show the full benefits of recycling renewable materials. And uh, one of the values with recycling renewable materials that we see is that we uh, will release material for other uses. And that's generally not covered in these methods. It's outside the system boundaries, I would say. At least in the methods we focused on. And we, we still have an ongoing discussion on wh what's the best for us to use? Should we, uh, is it enough to use simple cutoff methods for many cases? Or should we move over to use, which would then be our preference, the circular footprint formula in more cases? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Penilla. Um, this the case study you did is is in a in a short uh, annex to to our report, uh, as are the other case studies. Um, so it's condensed, but I hope people can turn to you for for more information if they if they need more information on your case study. Of course. <laughs> I need to Okay, do you see a black screen? Yes. Um, so, compiling information about the different uh, approaches to the allocation problem, uh, it, it became apparent that that uh, the different methods have, have reflect different views on what the allocation problem is really about, and it's not just that, as I said before. You can see you can describe it as as either uh, allocating the environmental benefits or or uh, deciding how much of the environmental benefits of recycling should be uh, included in your your LC on one hand on the other hand it can be described as allocating the actual environmental burdens of of uh, virgin material production and final waste disposal um, if you look at the cutoff methods, for instance, and then uh, the allocation problem, the challenge is really only to to decide uh, what part of the recycling process should be uh, recorded in your in your LCA. Um, so volume production and, and uh, final disposal is, is not not really part of the allocation problem with that approach. But most, <coughs> most other methods, or all other methods, include virgin material production in, in the uh, problem to be solved or to be addressed. Um, and some of them also include the final waste disposal. And the APOS stands for allocation at the point of substitution. Uh, it's a method described in, in ECOINVENT, and it describes um, 
recycled material from a life cycle as a byproduct of the life cycle as a whole. So then the allocation problem is really uh, concerns the life cycle as a whole. You have to decide how much of this life cycle should be uh, attributed to the uh, recycled material leaving the product. So they differ in terms of in, in the description or, or understanding of what the allocation problem is, and of course also in how the allocation problem should be addressed. Um, and some, many of them, in many of them, the uh, the content of recycled material is important. The only only uh, really exception from that is the allocation to material losses or end of life or approach or closed loop pro uh, approach as it is described sometimes where the recycling rate after the rate of recycling after use is the only thing that really matters uh, many most methods also account for uh, the uh, the recycling rate most other methods that come for recycling rates, ex except the, the extreme um, uh, other extreme method allocation to virgin material use, where the only thing that matters is what how, how much recycling material is it is in your product. Simple cutoff is sometimes called a recycling content approach because. Because the only benefit you get from recycling is that you do not have to include uh, other kind of waste disposal in your in your uh, um, That means that the recycling rate, the recycling content, is often more important than, than the recycling rate of the use. Some of the methods, the complicate, more complicated methods, include. Uh, either the quality of accounts for either the quality of the material, quality losses in recycling, or the price and, and uh, loss in economic value of the material. And uh, the circular footprint formula has a factor A, which reflects how the markets for, for recycled, recyclable materials work. And this is also the basis for the This is a, you could say, a summary of the uh, description of, or conclusions from the descriptions of the methods. Um, I have, uh, um, I'll, I have a um, special interest for the distinction between attributional and consequential LCA, and I use the, the uh, <coughs> distinction illustrated by Bovey de Mine 2003 and 3, where uh, attribution LSD is about um, identifying what part of the global environmental burdens belong to the product. Consequential LSD is about how the production and use of the product affects the environmental burdens of the world. And with this distinction, you can you can <coughs> discuss whether a method fits in an attributional LCA or in a consequential LCA. And several of the methods actually fit in, in, in both kinds of LCA, depending on whether you include in the method the actual virgin material production or the or, or material used in the product or the avoided material production, um, the material production that is avoided through recycling of use. So different methods fit in different contexts, in different types of LCA, and also in different types of applications. When we debated the methods uh, towards the end of the project, <coughs> uh, I structured the, this debate in, into three, three application areas, policy making, external communication, and internal use in the organization. Three different applications of LCA results. And um, because I thought 
they would have different requirements on the method, different requirements on the LCA, and hence different requirements on the method of modeling recycling. Um, but it turned out that there are overlaps between these policy areas, for instance, environmental product declarations uh, is a way of, is a, is a tool for external communication, but it's also a tool for green procurement, which is, uh, uh, which is a policy instrument. Uh, so there are overlaps between uh, these these uh, application areas. There are also important differences between within the policy, the application areas. For instance, um, between making an LCA to produce, generate knowledge uh, that is useful for a policy decision, or making an LCA uh, to prove that your product fulfills a requirement or or uh, to demonstrate the environmental, uh, well, for instance, the environmental product declaration in green procurement. In the first case, uh, the uh, LCA should be made to generate as much relevant knowledge as possible. Uh, but in the same, but in the second case, it's very important that the method is. is uh, that the LCA is uh, reproducible and, com and different LCAs are com can be compared so that the method needs to be very robust in terms of uh, who is doing the LCA and what is the interest behind making the LCA. So uh, towards the end, we identified three different uh, types of, of um, application area where you had have different main requirements. If you want to do an LCA to provide information for a policy decision or for strategic uh, decision in, in industry, in strategic investment for instance, or to communicate to have an open communication about your product and its life cycle, then you need uh, a tailor-made method, a method that is tailor-made to to generate as much, much knowledge as possible. If you <coughs> instead are doing an environmental product declaration, so demonstrating that your your LCA, your your products reduce the carbon dioxide emissions to, and and lives up to specific requirements on that, as in the renewable energy directive. Then you need a method that is predefined and very in, in, in a high level of detail so that it's uh, robust and uh, repro uh, repro reproducible. And then when this is the blue areas in, in the table. And then uh, the yellow areas when you, when you do LCA for uh, to make to make a uh, frequent decisions when in, in, for instance, product development or, or optimizing your production process or so, then you need a, a method that is really simple to, to apply, uh, easy to use. Um, doesn't really require that the method is, is simple in itself. If you have, a, if it's implemented, for instance, in a software tool, then it can still be uh, easy to use. But still, there are different, apparently different requirements on, 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 on the methods depending on the uh, application. And as we could see in the uh, assessment results, there is a trade-off between, for instance, generating knowledge on the, on the consequences of recycling and having a method that is easy to use and uh, robust. This means that that it's difficult, probably difficult to find a method that that fits all purposes, uh, and you will need still need a, a, a set of methods, and instead discuss what methods are used for. instead of look, looking for a single method. Discuss what methods to use in different applications. 
Mm -hmm. okay, where we landed in the uh, project, uh, or at least in the debate that uh, at the towards the end of the of the project. Thomas, uh, yeah. we we need to move on now, so there will be some time left for questions. Yes. I just wanted to say that we still we are already considering where uh, follow-up projects. For instance, we we um, uh, have in this project we we, mod we discuss modeling of post-consumer waste, uh, and uh, same methods might be applicable, but there might be difference differences in in how to model. The recycling of production waste. Um, so we're considering uh, a project to, to, that, to discuss that. And we're also discussing, as, as Panilla uh, was discussing, the, the, the comparison between recycling and energy recovery. Then we need to also discuss the modeling of energy recovery. What methods fits in attributional and consequential LCA, for instance? And uh, if circular footprint formula has a factor A, for recycling, it has a factor B, also a factor B for modeling of energy recovery. That factor has not yet been discussed. Could you be interested in participating in this in any of these projects? Please let me know at the email address Vera at thomasekvall.se uh, and we'll see what we can what we can do together. Thank you very much.